Now, more stories, insights, and analysis of Illinois policy and politics. This is Illinois Rising, presented by the Illinois Policy Institute. Once again, your host, AM560's Dan Proft. Dan Proff back with John Tillman, President and CEO of the Illinois Policy Institute. And uh, John, uh, circling back to the uh, AFSME discussion we had uh, a bit earlier in the show, the feud with uh, Ronner continues. And uh, one of the arguments that uh, AFSME makes in advance of this 2 to $3 billion contract they want to see the governor sign on to is that, uh, you know, to kind of just keep in pace with the Joneses, that uh, state workers are underpaid or they would be underpaid if they didn't receive the bumps that AFSCME is proposing. Well, I think what they mean by that, Dan, is AFSCME workers want to keep pace with the one percenters because what we have here is class warfare. The average AFSCME worker, depending on which, uh, I, let me start over. AFSCME workers in the state of Illinois, highest paid in the country for state workers. Average of 59000 by a, a recent study that came out. CMS's own data shows the average AFSCME worker is making 66000 This is per worker. The average household income in Illinois 50,000. You have people who are poorer than ASME workers being asked to give them a raise out of their own paycheck and transferring it into an ASME worker's paycheck. This is immoral. 40,000 people should not govern the lives of 13 million. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting because uh, if you compare them to their private sector counterparts in similar job classifications, the total compensation package is about 27% higher state workers as compared to private sector counterparts. So it's a difficult um, thing to... Uh, make a moral case for, as you suggest, it's also a different thing, to, a difficult thing to sustain financially. But it didn't stop uh, a Moral Monday protest this week. Moral Mondays, uh, this, these are the protests of uh, kind of the professional agitating class on the left. Outside of uh, Ken Griffin's offices, Citadel, the hedge fund that he runs, Ken Griffin, one of the wealthiest uh, residents of Illinois, uh, and they were saying, basically, uh, it's time for the rich to pay their fair share or we're going to take what we need. Well, the rich already pay the top uh, four tenths of one percent of income taxpayers in the state of Illinois pay 33 percent of the income taxes already. Four, uh, four tenths of a percent. The top four tenths of a percent. Right. Pay a third. Pay a third. Yeah. So I think that's not uh, progressive enough. That's, that's not apparently not, a, not, enough. A, not enough, uh, Dan, not enough. Uh, and the point I heard you make actually earlier uh, in the week in your show is you could liquidate all eight billion dollars of Ken Griffin's holdings. And that would, by the way, that ask me contract, that's a three billion dollar increase in cost. Right. It's an right, increase. Right. Right. So so Ken Griffin could pay for three years worth of that increase and then he's out of money. There's not enough wealthy people in the state. There's only two hundred seventeen thousand people who make two hundred fifty thousand dollars or more out of 13 million. You can't get the money there. They have to come after the working class and middle class. And that's why the solution is to solve the spending problem. And that's why this contract can't go forward. And, and the other uh, matter with respect to the kind of the soak the rich or soak them uh, more completely than you're already soaking them, I guess you could suggest based on the numbers you just provided, is uh, those people making 250 grand or more, not to mention those people with $8 billion in holdings, they have mobility. It turns right. out they can locate somewhere else. And last year, 3,000 millionaires who lived in the city of Chicago decided to live somewhere else. It was the third highest outmigration of millionaires of any international city just behind Paris and Rome. And so this becomes uh, something that just expedites the death spiral of the state. Absolutely. And the other side of this that is critically important to understand is that you have the left likes to talk about fairness, justice, yeah. income inequality. State workers have higher pay than private sector workers on average. Better benefits by far than private sector workers on average. Pay less for those benefits than private sector workers on average. Will retire with somewhere, uh, depending on which one you want, which category you want to pick, $2.5 million in an annuity benefit when they retire if you're a teacher, somewhere between $1.2 and $1.6 million if you work for one of the other unions, whereas the private sector worker maxes out at $30,000 a year. We have income inequality. Through Social Security. Through Social Security. Thank you. We have income inequality. It is the unions who have the excess. It is taxpayers who are on the short end of the stick, and that has to be reformed to make it fair. And it seems to me uh, we have some indications of what happens when you live in a public sector union-centric society playing themselves out on the international stage. Greece, the protests, 7,000 people protesting Greece austerity measures, uh, uh, Greek austerity measures that are being imposed upon them by their EU creditors for them to continue being essentially financed out of bankruptcy. This despite they have a socialist president. 
Right. Cyprus is a right. socialist president of right. Greece. But even, uh, you know, uh, th- th- that philosophy can't get you out of where you put yourself into when folks like they were in Greece are retiring in their early 50s with these kind of benefits packages. You just don't have a big enough private sector workforce to finance all the largesse. So it's kind of a, a look ahead. And uh, I'll tell you what, the left doesn't seem to get it. You know how I know? Because Chelsea Clinton's husband just had to close his hedge fund this week after blowing $25 million of investor money because he bet that Greece was going to right the ship. <laughs> yeah, little tip for you out there, don't bet on socialists. He should have uh, just consulted with Hillary's uh, expert in cattle futures. But, I mean, we really have a look ahead with examples like Greece and Puerto Rico. I think what's really interesting about this as well is the union. Uh, some people like to call them union bosses. I like to call them union executives because they're really well paid. Yes. And they, they're making two, three, four times what rank and file union members make. The average union member, the rank and file member, they're just doing their part in the game, just like anybody else right. does, trying to provide for their family. The average union person is not the problem. The guy working for the state, the teacher trying to teach your children, the guy driving the truck uh, for SEIU or somebody else, they're not the problem. The problem is the union bosses who know the deal is corrupt and give political campaign contributions to people in Springfield who sign off on these deals and know it's corrupt. And then the, when the game comes home to roost, they're all gone in Florida. It's the circle. There's the circle of life. And what you just described is the circle of economic death.